It's good to be back here with you again. How many of you had a, a good week this past week? Everybody have a good week? Had the privilege of my wife and I to travel to Rogersville, Missouri, close to, to Nixa, Springfield area, uh, Missouri area, to visit my mother on her 90th birthday two days ago. This coming weekend we'll be going back to have a big, big party with a lot of the members of the family. But I'm thankful for a godly mama, as I would call her. Um, I'm a mama's boy. I think I shared that with you before. And so it's always good whenever I can go see my mama. But um, this past, um, probably I think it was August, last August, she fell and, and broke a bone above her hip. And so she had to be in hospital and therapy and those kind of things. And she got C. diff, if you know what that is. And so that affected her foot so she couldn't walk. And then my sister tried to bring her back to the house and that didn't work. So she's back in, she was back in a home for a while. And in the midst of all of that, whenever my sister was trying to get her placed in some place, she was diagnosed with COVID. And so she's had C. diff, she's had COVID, but she's a... Uh, She's a tough old bird, as my dad would, would call her. And so I'm thankful to have my, my mom that's still here with today. And this, this much I do know for sure that at this very moment, she's praying for me and she's praying for this church. She's a, she's a praying woman. And, um, and mom, mom went through the eighth grade. Uh, she was raised in a time where grandpa said, there's no need for you to go to high school. You're just going to get married and have kids. And so she graduated high school and got married and had six kids. And so, but I'm thankful for the simple faith of my mom that simply says you need to pray for him you need to love people she um, a number of years back had had to go to the hospital for chemo she had had breast cancer and before she went um, she baked cookies my sister said what are you doing baking cookies she said well the nurses need to eat sweets don't they and so that's just just that that giving kind of person and I'm thankful for that and, I, and, and my question for each of us is, is what legacy are we leaving for those that, that come after us? Is it a legacy of love? Is it a, is it a legacy of serving others? And I, and I hope that it is. The last few weeks we talk about the purposes of the church. And you remember we spelled out wife. Um, the purposes of the church are worship. We must gather together and worship. And by the way, um, Alex and the team on a regular basis do a wonderful job of, of ushering us into worship. You see, they can't, they can't worship for you, but they can worship and it draws us into that. And so worship's part, one of the purposes. And one of the purposes is instruction. We said that all of our beliefs, our, our life, our, our attitudes, everything must be based alone on God's word. But it's not just about worship. It's not just studying God's word. It's fellowship. And we said in Baptist circles, that usually means food. It can. But, but in fellowship, we have to love and encourage and build up each other. And we talked a little bit about all the one another's in the Bible. Last week, we talked about the purpose being evangelism. We must care enough about those outside the walls of the church to do something to reach them. If you remember last week, um, those of you that were here, put somebody's name on a card and put it in the offering plate and I want you to continually pray for them we're coming upon a time called Easter when a lot of people will come to church so pray about not if but how you're going to invite those people that you wrote that card you're going to invite them to hear the message of Jesus and you're going to pray and we need to pray God use me in whatever way you see fit to reach them well today I want to get more specific you see, it's not just that it's the, it's the church's responsibility, but we have responsibility as individuals. We are to be fully devoted followers of Christ. That's to be our goal as a Christian, fully devoted followers of Christ. So today we want to look at embracing our specific purpose. We have to embrace God's purposes for us. In my job now, I serve as Mission One Coordinator for General Baptist International Ministries, and I've had the chance to, to visit a number of locations and, and see the needs that are there. But you know what? There are needs right here in Dexter, Missouri, aren't there? And we have a responsibility to be the light to the world. You see, God has always had a missionary purpose. He's always had the objective of making himself known, glorifying himself, and blessing all the people groups of the world. Think about this. The first missionary ever was Jesus, who left heaven to come to the earth. 
Now, with everything you've heard about heaven, would you ever want to leave heaven? But yet, it was necessary for the salvation of the world. So, the first international, intergalactic missionary, worldwide missionary, was Jesus himself. Jesus is God. He's a member of the Trinity. He has the same character, objectives, and authority as his Father. And when, when Jesus gave the directive to go and make disciples in the Great Commission, we're going to read that here in a second, he had the authority of God because he was God in human form. And so we have the responsibility, the responsibility to reach out to the world. Now let's look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Quite often I will allude to these verses, and in a little bit we're going to look at Acts 1.8. But I think these verses are significant for a number of reasons. It gives us our purpose, but it's also some of the last words that Jesus shared before he ascended to heaven. Now parents or grandparents, think back to the first time you're probably really nervous, but you left, you left your kids at home without any parent there. You, you remember that? You gave them strict instructions, didn't you? Don't you dare. Don't you dare. Now, don't you forget. Oh, and by the way, don't you forget. I think in a sense that's the Great Commission. Jesus is saying, okay, I'm getting ready to leave now. Now, listen up. So let's look at the Great Commission, some of the last words of Jesus. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In other words, Jesus says, I have the authority to say what I'm about to say. Therefore, or as a result of my authority, go and make disciples of, what's it say? All nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I love that last, that last phrase there. Oh, and by the way, you're not going by yourself. I'm with you. I will go before you. Now let's notice, let's notice this, that the Great Commission constitutes the marching orders of the church. Now what did Jesus command? He said they are to make disciples. They are to do this by going, by baptizing, by teaching. They were to move beyond their own comfort level to those that are different than them. Can we acknowledge that we live in a different world, don't we? We come in all shapes and sizes, hair colors, lots of hair, not much hair, all of that. But we're to reach everyone. And we're to not only reach out to them and bring them to Christ, but we are to baptize them, by the way, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we are to, to reach them so that they, in turn, could reach others. Well, let's notice three things about the Great Commission. Three things. The first thing is this. We are instructed to do what? Say it again. We are instructed to do what? Go. To go. We're not instructed to just sit in church and wait for visitors to come to us. These are comfortable seats, aren't they? You feel good, right? Could almost sleep in them, right? Maybe, maybe some have before. But, but our responsibility is not just to come and be comfortable within the walls of the church and just wait for visitors to show up. You see, I do think we need to pray for, for visitors. By the way, maybe a better term is guests, right? A visitor is someone that comes and finally leaves. A guest is someone that you want to welcome into your home. Should Risen Church pray for guests to come to this church? But should we just pray and sit and wait for them to come? Or should we reach out to them? Here's what one old preacher said. We shouldn't sit, soak, and sour, okay? We're to go. We're to carry the message to those who are lost, to those who have no hope. And verse 18 could be better translated, as you are going. As you go through your life, as you get up in the morning, make disciples in your own home. As you go to the store, make disciples. As you work, wherever you go, make disciples. Evangelism is to be the heartbeat of the church. I shared with you that song last week, If Men Go to Hell, Who Cares? We must care that people are dying without Jesus. Amen? We love to talk about heaven. Amen? I, I, I can't wait to get to heaven. My father's already there. I can't wait to see him again. I can't wait to, to bow at the feet of Jesus. But my friends, there also is a hell. 
And so we have a responsibility to go. But we're also instructed to make disciples. Now I've never, how many of you like to go fishing? How many of you have ever told a fish story? Okay, you admit it, right? Preachers and fish stories go one and the same. So if it's a preacher that's a fisherman, you can't believe anything that they say. But anyway, (laughs) but I've never understood people who go fishing and don't even care if they catch a fish. Now, any of you like that? You don't even care if you catch? I, I don't understand that. Or those people who catch a fish and throw it back. I mean, if I catch a fish and go through the trouble of catching a fish, I want to I clean it and eat it. Unless it's the size of a minnow, then it's a little bit more difficult. But some people are in love with the idea of just going fishing. Just go spend some time out there. But not with catching the fish or the hassle of cleaning the fish. Now, why would I, what, where am I going? I'm afraid that some people are in love with coming to church without being the church. You understand what I'm saying? We kind of come and, can I tell you, Christianity is not a spectator sport. How many of you love to, to yell at the coach of your favorite team on TV and tell them what they're doing wrong? Anybody else like to do that? If they would just listen to you. And I'm afraid in Christianity, if we're not careful, we do that. We can, we can say what's wrong, but we don't do anything to reach out to others. My point's this. Being the church, making disciples, it's not easy. When you go fishing, sometimes you have to be real patient, don't you? Sometimes the weather isn't conducive to fishing, but you have to do it anyway. Sometimes you have to be inconvenient. You have to get up early if you want to go and catch the fish. Well, evangelism, making disciples, is not easy. A number of years back, a church that I was on staff at, We decided at the beginning of the year that throughout that year, every time somebody accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord, every time somebody became a Christian, we were going to light a candle. By the end of the year, we had about 58 candles lit. By the way, the church was the size of about 220 people. And in a sense, it's like, oh, praise the Lord, 58 candles. But here was the conviction that me and the pastor felt. We couldn't tell you where the majority of those people were. You see what really needed to happen? After they accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord, somebody from the church needed to say, that's mine, that's the one I'm going to follow up on. That's the one I'm going to mentor. That's the one I'm going to reach out to. You see, new Christians have to be fed and nurtured, don't they? Could you imagine having a newborn baby and just say, okay, there's the bottle, go for it. Change yourself. Now, Parker's about two years old. He thinks he can do some things himself, and he can, he can feed himself. I've never seen as much food on the floor as there is in in his body. But anyway, he's trying, but he still needs some assistance. Still needs to be changed. He, He can't change himself yet. Look forward to that day. But anyway, new Christians have to be fed and nurtured and challenged to mature in their walk. But that takes time. By the way, if we're going to challenge new Christians to mature in their walk, guess what we need to do? We need to mature in our walk as well, don't we? Well, there's a third part of this, and I think this is important in in this Great Commission passage. Jesus promises he's always with us. Isn't that encouragement? Jesus is always with you. If you're the only Christian in your household, Jesus is with you. If you feel like you're the only Christian where you work, Jesus is with you. If you feel like you're the only Christian at the school where you go, Jesus is with you. Even though we can't see Jesus, we know that he's with us. Jesus knows we're weak. He knows we're insecure. He knows our fears and our doubts, and that's why he came to live among us. And that's why he gave us the promise that he is with us always. The disciples were to make disciples of all nations. Now think about that. That's over nine thousand different language groups. There's, there's 9,000 different languages in our world and about 16,000 different people groups. Now this great commission Jesus gave must have seemed close to impossible to the disciples. By the way, let me tell you, it is impossible. It is impossible to make disciples in our own strength, in our own power. But with Jesus, how much is possible? All things are possible. 
So Jesus says he's going to be with us till the task is finished. And so we go because Jesus is with us. We evangelize because Jesus is with us. By the way, if you share Jesus with someone and they reject that, that witness, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting Jesus. So we must reach out to others. But there's more to the story. What would Paul Harvey say now the rest of the story? Just before ascending back to his father, Jesus has one last meeting with his disciples. And after the death and resurrection of Jesus and with the sending of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, God's mission to the nations was to go forth through his followers, the church. That's you and me. So let's look at this verse, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I love this verse. It's a very challenging verse. But it says what? Does it say you might receive power? But you what? Will receive power when? When you study enough. When you get smart enough. When you get you enough learning. That's when it happens. What? You will receive power when what? The Holy Spirit comes on you. And you might be my witnesses. No, when the Holy Spirit is controlling us, we will be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You see, when the church is not being his witness, it's because we're not being controlled by the Holy Spirit. We must be led by the Spirit. Well, the spread of the Christian witness overcomes four barriers. First, it overcomes geographic barriers. It was to move out from Jerusalem to increasingly remote regions. Let's look at this this way. The witness of risen church. Risen church should have a strong witness in Dexter, amen? And throughout Stoddard County in this area, right? Amen? But you have to move beyond that. Can I tell you, even living in southeast Missouri for five, year, five and a half years now, there's a lot of variety even in southeast Missouri, isn't there? Not everybody's as smart as people in Dexter, right? Is that, I mean, you know, and not everybody's as smart as us folks in, in Poplar Bluff, Missouri that live in the suburbs of Poplar Bluff. But it overcomes geographic barriers. You see, here's the point. Yes, we do need to be concerned about people close by, but that's not all there is. It also overcomes ethnic barriers. The gospel was to move out from the people of Israel to the Samaritans, a people of mixed Israelite and, and non-Israelite lineage and onto diverse ethnic groups. Can I tell you, even in Stoddard County, even in this county, even in Dexter, there's a variety of ethnic groups represented, aren't there? A variety of ethnic groups. We come in all shapes and sizes. And there are people that are culturally different. How many of you that are, uh, are more seasoned adults, remember there's no such thing as old people, seasoned adults would say that it's difficult for me to understand teenagers today. Will you raise your hand? How many of you, are, how many of you are, are currently raising teenagers? Raise your hands. I can tell by looking at you. No. Um, <laughs> how many of you say it is difficult trying to understand teenagers? How many of you who are teenagers and young adults that are here would say, man, there's some things about Old people that I just don't understand. Does anybody here want to admit that? Everybody raising their hands, right? We are a diverse group, but we can't pick and choose who we want to love. It moves beyond geographic barriers. It moves beyond ethnic barriers. It also overcomes religious barriers. You see, I do believe that Jesus is not a way, but Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. I believe that the Bible is not a source. It is the source. But I also believe this. We must love everyone, even those that don't agree with us. We must love that Muslim. We must love that Hindu person. We must love that person that says, I don't believe there's such a thing as God. We must love them. We must reach out to them. And again, how many other religions are represented even in Stoddard County? But we have to love people. Do we believe that Jesus Christ tasted death for everyone? That's everyone then, right? Does that mean everyone? Yeah, it means everyone. I can't help but think, and every time 
when we get toward the anniversary of September 11th. Everybody knows what happened on September 11th, 2001. But we're told that the people who flew the planes, the pilots who flew the planes, had been in the States for a number of months. I'm just crazy enough to think that some of that could have been avoided if some Christians could have reached out to these people. Do we believe that Jesus Christ stays to death for everyone? So we have to reach out to everyone. You see, you, we can't judge people by how they look on the outside, can we? But we do, don't we? Like, oh, i got to avoid them because of how they look. Can I tell you, you can look real good on the outside and be as lost as lost can be on the inside anyway. And so it has to overcome religious barriers. Did Jesus Christ taste death for everyone or did he not? Yes, he did. And as good General Baptists, we say that Jesus Christ tasted death for who? For everyone. But I'm afraid many times we say we believe it, but the way we act, we don't. You see, there's no, there's no room in the body of Christ for any type of prejudice toward any type of group. Now, I grant that but sometimes we have some experiences with a, with a particular people group, if you will. And it causes us to struggle with, with not even hating them. But we must reach out, we must love everyone. Well, there's a fourth barrier that it overcomes. It overcomes national barriers. God's purpose, God's mission is to include people in his kingdom, people from every tribe, every nation, and every language. Now, for a number of years, I, I grew up in, in St. Louis area. And I was comfortable in the St. Louis area. Then I expanded my horizons, and I moved to the big me metropolis of Oakland City, Indiana, population 3,000 people. And then I moved back home to my secure area. And I was one of those people who would say, why should we worry about people anywhere else when we have needs right here? Why should we care about people from other countries when we have needs right here. And then I eventually went on my first mission trip, international mission trip, and I've never been the same. I've been to places like Jamaica, where the community centers around the church, you know, like it used to be in the United States a number of years back. And as the church goes, the community goes. I've been to the Philippines where some of the students at General Baptist Bible College are the only Christians in their Muslim family. Yet they come there and they want to reach others for Christ. And by the way, we now have a General Baptist Church in Japan led by graduates from the General Baptist Bible College in the Philippines. That's pretty cool stuff. I've been to India before and Brittany could tell you a whole lot about India. And I was, um, Mark Powell, who's the General Baptist International Ministries Director, he tried to prepare me. He said, I'm telling you, when you go to India, it's going to be different than any place you've ever been. You're going to be convicted in ways that you've never felt convicted before. And boy, was he right. We, had to, we, had to, we got stopped at the airport, and, and uh, some people from this church were, were with us on the trip that I took. We got stopped at the airport and had to be asked where we were going, what you're going to be doing, and it, and it, it makes you a little bit uneasy. But then I met Brittany's family. And Jesse's posse, we kiddingly called it, his, his team that, that he travels with. And those people who love God with everything within them. And then we, every place we went, we were honored. We didn't want honor, but we were honored because we were willing to come there. And then one, one day we went, did a medical clinic. And I'll never forget a guy that was there. And his back was just terribly scarred. And come to find out, the reason was they had a fire in their little house and he had a seizure and he fell into the fire. And he couldn't get to another location to get treatment. And so our General Baptist brothers and sisters in India were ministering to him and people like that. Of course, this church in a powerful, major way has built wells in India, so people can have clean drinking water. I've been to our friends just south of the border, Mexico, in Saipan and Guam, had the chance to go to China. 
My wife couldn't have been more nervous and scared. My mom couldn't have been more nervous and scared of my sister because you, you'll never get back from China. And as I went to China, I met Christians who are willing to risk their life for the cause of Christ because they understand that Jesus Christ tasted death for everyone. But the place I've been the most times is Honduras, and that's when things begin to change for me. As I went to, to Honduras, I think there's a picture that, that will be, get posted here. The third trip I went to Honduras, we went and visited a government orphanage. Now, I grew up in a, a family of six children. We didn't have much, but, but what we had, we would offer to everyone. And we went to this government orphanage, and we visited with the kids, then we went to the nursery. And in the nursery, there were 25 kids, one lady taking care of them, two babies to each bed. And I was going to be strong because I took a group of college students, and I didn't want them to see me cry because real men don't cry. And I wasn't going to hold any babies because I thought, man, I'm going to fall apart if I hold one of these babies. So I'm not going to hold any babies. I'm going to be strong for everyone else. And Teresa Walls, her, her husband Rodney, her missionaries there, they, this was their first term. She said, do you want to hold her? I said, no. She said, you need to hold her. So I held, held her. You can't tell by the picture, but she was very skinny, probably about two and a half years old. And I picked her up, and I held her. And you can't see it, but you, her hand, I could feel her hand on my back. And she's patting my back as I'm holding her. And I about fell apart right then. Then we had to put the babies down and leave the nursery. We put the babies down, leave the nursery to a bunch of babies crying. We get back to the team house. And the college students I was with said, we failed. We didn't do any good today. I said, oh, but we did today. How do we do any good? I said, for at least a half hour today, there are a number of babies that understood what it's like to be loved. You see, the good news of Jesus is that Jesus Christ takes the death for everyone. And, and how many of you get nervous when it comes to sharing your faith out loud? We all do. How many of you know how to hold a baby? How to play with kids? How to fix food? How to give a cup of cold water in his name. You see, we make it more difficult than this. We are simply to care about others. And the church today must be about sharing Christ. In the midst of all this crazy pandemic, you know, the year anniversary, there's been some neat things that have happened. There's been a number of churches that have distributed food and those kind of things to people. And I hope as churches, when, when we eventually get beyond that, that we still understand the need to physically meet people's needs. And I hope we will continue to do that. But we must embrace our purpose. We all, part of, your plan, part of God's plan for your life. Yes, we have different gifts and different abilities, different personality, different temperament. But part of God's purpose for your life is for you to love him and to love others. It's to reach out to others. Risen church is the best yet to come for this church. Let's say that, try that again. It's the best yet to come for this church. And it will when what? When this church continues to be the church, to be the light. Well, you know, Jim, it sounds all well and good, but what if we don't? I mean, why? I mean, I've got my fire insurance. I'm, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I just wish Jesus would hurry up and return for me. Why is it so important? Is it really that big of a deal? What if I don't? Matthew chapter 25. Verses 34 through 40. I want to read them out of the New Living Translation. Very pointed passage. By the way, this is Jesus speaking. It says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. Listen to this. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, 
and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? And when did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Risen church, when you gave money for wells in India, you were giving wells to Jesus. When you give to unified giving and support denominational ministries, you're giving to Jesus. When you do a harvest offering to meet needs in Stoddard County, you're doing it to Jesus. You see, we have a responsibility it is good news about Jesus Christ, amen? It is good news that no matter what you've done in your life, you can be forgiven, you can begin new. That's, that's good news, but it's not just good news for you and me, it's good news for everyone we come in contact with. And if ever the world desperately needed the church to rise up and be the church, it's today. Can we admit something? A lot of the criticism leveled against the church today is deserved. We really do need to be people who love God and love others. Now, understand something. We still must speak the truth. But how does the Bible say we should speak the truth? In love. In love. We live in a time of unparalleled opportunities. If the pandemic's taught us anything, it's how far we can reach even through technology. We have a responsibility. Listen to this verse, John chapter 4, verse 35. It says, Do you not say, Four months more, and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. I say to you, risen church, open your eyes. The fields are Outside these doors, across the street, across the state, across the country, across the world, they are ripe for harvest. So that's simply our challenge today. God's saying to each of us, open your eyes. You ever said that to one of your kids when they couldn't find something and it was right in front of them? You ever lost your keys and they were right in front of you? Or your glasses and they were on your head? <laughs> Jesus is saying, open your eyes. Open your eyes. So I say to Risen Church, open your eyes. The best is yet to come. God has great ministry to do with through this church. And by the way, it will not all rise and fall on any new pastor. It will rise and fall on the church being the church. Being obedient. To give out the abundance of all that God's given to you. You see, God doesn't expect you to give somebody else's gift. He expects you to use the gifts he's given to you to reach out to others. Would you please stand? We're going to pray and we'll have a song, a time of response. And maybe where you're at or even coming forward, you need to pray and confess to God, you know, God, I've, I've been too selfish. I've been only concerned about myself. Or maybe you want to come and pray for that name you wrote down last week, that person who desperately needs Jesus. Maybe today you want to commit to inviting some of those people here. You can, by the way, you can invite them to church on a Sunday besides Easter, but, but maybe you want, to, you want to look toward Easter on Resurrection Sunday, Risen Church Sunday, if you will. But the point is, we have the Great Commission. We've been commissioned to go to reach others for the cause of Christ. We've been told that as we are led by God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit... We will be his witnesses. If we're not being his witnesses, we're not being controlled by his spirit. God, thank you that you love us. God, I thank you that many years ago, I was someone else's mission. And they reached out to me. Because of them, I was introduced to you and I accepted you as Savior and Lord. God, I pray for each of us here today. God, as the song says, break our hearts for what breaks yours. 
Help us to truly love you and love others because God, when we reach out to others, when we, when we give money for a well, we're doing it in your name. When we, when we feed people, we do it in your name. When we reach out to that lonely person and encourage them and love on them, we, we do it to you. When we pick up that child and encourage them to be all that you want them to be, God, we do it to you. Oh, dear God, may we open our eyes and look at the fields. The ripe God. They're just waiting for someone to go. May we, may we be those that don't sit. May we be those who go. We pray through Jesus.